West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. So Trump's trial has wrapped for the day, and there was a major falling out between Trump's lawyer and the judge that we're going to talk about. But first, for those watching, Glenn and I are going to be covering this trial on a daily basis. So if you want to follow along with everything that happens, please make sure to subscribe. Okay, so Glenn, there was a pretty clear falling out already between Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanche, and Judge Mershon. Uh, and it happened during this long-awaited show cause hearing for Trump's 10 violations of his gag order. At one point, the judge even said that Blanche was losing all credibility. So in court speak, how bad is a phrase like that for a lawyer to be told in court? You know, Brian, I would say that's an 11 on the reputational Richter scale. I, you know, I know that sounds hyperbolic, but here's what I'd ask our viewers to do. Think about who in your life Whose opinion is most important to you? Maybe it's your spouse or your partner. Maybe it's your employer. Maybe it's your teacher or professor. If you're in school, if that person said to you, you are losing all credibility with me, how would that make you feel? You know, a judge isn't necessarily involved in a personal relationship with lawyers, but when you have a judge criticize you openly, harshly in court, I have been on the receiving end, not of any kind of criticism that approaches a judge saying, um, I, you know, you are losing all credibility with me, but I've had some judges lash out at me from time to time. I know how it makes me feel, uh, makes me, you know, want to redouble my efforts to make sure I do better. Maybe that's the impact it will have on Todd Blanche, Donald Trump's lead attorney. But I think most criminal law practitioners can tell you it's like the death knell. You know, it can impact the entire trial moving forward. You know, if a judge loses respect for an attorney and the arguments they're making such that the judge feels compelled to say, you're losing your credibility with me, you know, that really can color the entire rest of the trial. Well, Glenn, could the argument be made that the Trump team doesn't actually care what the judge thinks? I mean, their defendant, their their client, is attacking the judge every waking minute. He even attacked the judge in the immediate moments after the show cause hearing ended, and he violated his gag order 10 times. I don't know these attorneys, but I have a very hard time believing they don't care. Listen, I think they're probably in a tough spot. Now, they put themselves in that spot, but they're in a tough spot between the judge and Donald Trump because some of what Todd Blanche said in his opening statement was not very persuasive. Some of it wasn't even proper, and there were some objections made by the prosecution. Some of those objections were sustained. In other words, defense counsel, you're making improper statements to the jury in opening. That's not a good look. Um, but they are stuck between the judge and their client. And you know Donald Trump is urging them to say and do all sorts of outlandish and probably improper things in court. Now, 
I don't have a lot of sympathy for them because they've put themselves in that position. And, and let me just add this, Brian. I talk to a lot of my friends and colleagues who are career prosecutors and career defense attorneys. What we all acknowledge is that everybody, everybody who's charged with a crime has a right to zealous representation under the Sixth Amendment. Um, so we have rapists and murderers and folks who uh, sexually abuse children. I handled cases like those as a prosecutor. All of those people are entitled to zealous representation. However, when you have a client who not only committed all these crimes against American democracy, but who continues to try to kill our democracy, who has said, if I go free, if I'm reelected, I will be a dictator on day one. That's a special kind of animal as a criminal defendant. And I do question how defense attorneys choose to represent somebody, not because of the crimes they committed, but because the crimes they have told us they still want to commit democracy busting crimes. So I have relatively little sympathy for these attorneys because they are stuck between that rock and a hard place. They chose to put themselves there. Yeah, I think that was really well said. Uh, Glenn, was there anything else that stuck out at you from this, uh, this show cause hearing as the result of Donald Trump's 10 violations of his gag order? You know, Judge Mershon at the moment said he is going to reserve ruling. So we don't know if he's going to rule tomorrow or the next day or next week. I do think time is of the essence because we know Donald Trump can't help himself or won't help himself. He will continue to violate the gag order. He will continue to rack up counts of contempt. So I think now what we're all going to be waiting for is not only what is Judge Mershon's decision with respect to holding Donald Trump in criminal con contempt, I believe he will. The big ticket issue is what will the first sanction be? The first sanction is almost certainly going to be a fine, a penalty, money sanctions. And I think they talked about 10 accounts uh, of contempt. So that would be a thousand per count, $10,000, which of course means nothing to Donald Trump. But what I'm really going to be keeping an eye out for is what does Judge, Judge Mershon say to Donald Trump after he finds him in contempt and sanctions him? And I sure as heck hope what he says is next time we're going to be looking at, at that 30 day jail sentence possibility that is authorized under the law. So keep it up and I will make good on my promise to jail you. That's what I'm hoping we hear from Judge Mershon. You know, telling Donald Trump, you are now on notice, you know, no more thousand dollar fines. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, basically him not doing that and just leaving in place the ability for him to fine him a thousand dollars per violation is, is pretty much a runway for somebody who, at least on, on paper or purports to be a billionaire. I mean, it's a clear runway to just commit those violations with impunity at this point. So if, if it's either these $1,000 fines or 30 days in jail, then there's a major, major disparity between the two. And if he just opts to keep imposing these $1,000 fines, it's basically like saying, go on, you've, you've, you've got carte blanche to do whatever you want. It makes a mockery of court orders because Donald Trump will continue to violate the gag order. And what he'll be communicating to Judge Mershon is just put it on my tab. I right. can do this all day long. Right. Glenn, why do you think that Judge Mershon didn't rule right away? As of this recording, we still don't have a resolution on this issue. He reserved uh, he reserved judgment here. I think part of it is, you know, he got so frustrated with Todd Blanche, the defense attorney, because he kept asking him, listen, you're taking this position that this is not a violation of the gag order. Give me some case law, something analogous case law. It doesn't obviously have to involve a former president violating a gag order. Give me something. And Todd Blanche wouldn't answer the question. Nothing will get a judge more agitated than an attorney who won't answer the question. Because if the answer is there is no case law that's directly on point, there is no real analogous case law. But let me find some legal principles to argue. Todd Blanche had nothing, but he wouldn't even directly answer the question. What he ultimately said is, you know, I just think it's obvious and self-evident. And that really seemed to um, uh, bother. Let me use the word bother Judge Mershon, because I think in response to that, he said, you are losing all credibility with the court and the court means the judge. I think Judge Mershon may go back to chambers this evening may set his clerks on 
trying to find any case law that is at least instructive, that's relevant on the issue of, you know, whether these circumstances constitute criminal contempt. I believe they do. And if so, is there any guidance on the kind of sanctions that have been imposed, not just in New York? You can look to other jurisdictions for what we call persuasive authority. There's controlling authority. That would be an appellate court opinion in New York. And then there's persuasive authority. How have other judges and other jurisdictions handled loosely comparable circumstances? That is what Judge Mershon might be doing right now, digging into that kind of case law. And then maybe tomorrow he takes the bench and he says, I'm ready to render my opinion. Well, first of all, it's ridiculous that Judge Mershon has to do the job of Donald Trump's lawyers because they didn't come prepared with any case law to back up their case. And second of all, I think one of the claims that they were trying to make was that uh, that Donald Trump wasn't violating this gag order because he was quoting Jesse Waters. Well, first of all, him quoting Jesse Waters doesn't mean that he's just like, there's no loophole that says as long as you put quotes on somebody else's words that, and then you post them from your accounts that it doesn't count. You can't like get a loophole around what this gag order is trying to say. And second of all, he actually admitted, Donald Trump's attorney actually admitted that it wasn't even a direct quote. It was a manipulated quote because that would better serve what Donald Trump was trying to say. So either way you cut it, it doesn't help him here. And I think another thing that frustrated Judge Mershon is Um, Todd Blanche kept saying, well, he was responding to political attacks. So Judge Mershon said, "Okay, please show me the political (laughs) attacks from, you know, Stormy Daniels or from the jurors. Because remember, he was suggesting that, you know, liberal moles were sneaking on the jury. That's pretty dang offensive to to the whole criminal justice system and to jury service. And so Judge Mershon said, fine, you're making these arguments. Show me the tweets, the posts, the information that represent political attacks he was responding to, and the defense attorneys had nothing. You don't right. you don't make an argument to the court if you don't have something to back it up. For gosh sakes, do your homework. Yeah, and I think that that's the that's the fatal flaw of like the whole Trumpian argument kind of finding its way into the courtroom because while Donald Trump can make these make these outlandish claims on Fox News or on Truth Social and nobody's there to rebut anything, when you're actually in front of a judge and you don't have to live in this alternate universe, this this parallel universe, the upside down, and you actually have to answer for the things you say, it doesn't work out so well for these people. Uh, Glenn, if the defendant to that point wasn't Donald Trump, what would have happened to a regular guy who defied? a gag order once, much less 10 times. You know, he would have been promptly fined the first time and he would have been jailed the second time. Donald Trump has racked up at least 10 criminal contempts for which he has not been held accountable, even with a fine. So yes, the entire system is bending over backwards, catering to Donald Trump, treating him as they would treat no other defendant and in the process sacrificing the safety of everybody else, witnesses, jurors, prosecutors, judges, and their respective family members. So yeah, if, uh, if it wasn't Donald Trump, this person would have been jailed long ago and would probably be in pretrial detention for the entirety of the trial. Now, moving on to the, the second half of this trial day, David Pecker was on the stand. Is there anything that stuck out at you from that testimony? Yeah, so first of all, we've only scratched the surface of David Pecker's testimony. He is still on what's called direct examination. When you put a witness up, like a prosecution witness, that is the prosecutor conducting direct examination. Once you're done your initial round of questions, you tender the witness, you give them over to the defense for cross-examination, and after that, you get to do a little cleanup in what we call direct examination. We're still early on in David Pecker's testimony. It's direct examination, and he has just started to talk about the catch-and-kill scheme, the crooked little arrangement he had with Donald Trump to do three things. One, to publish positive stories about Donald Trump. Two, to publish negative stories about Donald Trump's opponents. Will anybody forget the National Enquirer headline that Ted Cruz's father somehow had something to do with the Kennedy assassination? Um, I don't know if Martians were also involved, but this is the stuff of David Pecker agreeing with Donald Trump to run negative stories about his opponents. And then the third thing, which is really the most damning and what we're going to hear much more about, is he agreed to be the eyes and ears of Donald Trump 
and to catch and kill stories, prevent them from being published, essentially to help Donald Trump in the political arena because Donald Trump had announced his candidacy to be president. And so we heard a little bit about a meeting at Trump Tower, for example, between who? David Pecker, Donald Trump, Mark Cohen, and we've heard that Hope Hicks was in and out of the meeting. I can't wait for Hope Hicks' testimony because she has been completely sort of under the radar. We don't know exactly what she's going to provide, particularly by way of direct conversations with Donald Trump. But, you know, once she hits the stand, I would say hold on tight because that could be some real blockbuster testimony. The other thing I wanted to mention in David Pecker's testimony was that he said Donald Trump is very detail oriented. I would almost call him a micromanager. That does not really support one of the things Todd Blanche said in his opening statement on behalf of Donald Trump, which is that Donald Trump was basically just, I'm going to paraphrase here, this sort of, you know, uninvolved imbecile in the dark all the time. And he was just writing, get this, these $30,000 checks on his personal checking account over and over and over and over and over and over again to the tune of $420,000 and just giving them to Michael Cohen for goodness knows what. David Pecker kind of laid to rest that Donald Trump just didn't know what was going on here, didn't know what he was doing when he was signing $30,000 check one after another. So David Pecker is going to hurt Donald Trump in a lot of ways. And as I say, his direct examination has only just begun. And, and that was actually my, my last question here is in what way can Pecker's testimony be the most damaging to Trump? In what way is the Trump team most afraid of what David Pecker can do? So here is how it will hurt Trump the most. It's going to dovetail with the testimony of who? Michael Cohen. And Michael Cohen's credibility is, uh, is pretty poor given that he's a convicted felon and he's lied in the past, although he lied several times over to protect Donald Trump, to keep him out of hot water, to try to save the boss's butt. So, you know, you can kind of turn those lies from weaknesses into strengths. And I would argue all day long, guess what? If I had to pick a witness, you know, I wouldn't pick Michael Cohen, but I didn't pick the witness. Donald Trump chose to engage in this corrupt and ultimately criminal scheme with Michael Cohen. So ladies and gentlemen, of course, we will present Michael Cohen to you because that's Donald Trump's man and former attorney and fixer. And the fact that Donald Trump has been going after Michael Cohen, going after him like gangbusters for years, when David Pecker, who Donald Trump has not spoken one critical word of, says, oh yeah, I was talking with Michael Cohen and we agreed to do X, Y, and Z on behalf of Donald Trump. And I had conversations with Donald Trump about some of these things. What it does is it bolsters Michael Cohen's credibility. It corroborates him. So the jury will not have to believe Michael Cohen in isolation, in a vacuum. They're going to say, well, David Pecker said the exact same thing. And he really didn't have his credibility attacked. So it's not hard for us to accept the testimony of Michael Cohen when it dovetails with what David Pecker testified to. That is part of the power of Pecker's testimony. Right. And I think that's especially important because Donald Trump's team is relying so heavily right now on conveying this idea that Michael Cohen is by no means a credible witness. And so this would kind of completely undermine their ability to convey that message to the jury. It is Wednesday. The 24th of April of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, the little Yorkie, is our door girl. And as you know, she's been hobbling a bit from this recent knee surgery, in which she will be getting the staples out on Thursday coming this day after tomorrow. But in the interim, we all will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of these Christo fascists? Oh my. Yep. Priests, pastors, if you're a Christo fascist, Christo nationalist, eh, we, we need to rid you from our body politic. All right. Okay. 
I seem to be a little stuffed up this morning. I think it's because of uh, some of the pollen that's floating about during the springtime. So I apologize for any uh, clicks and weird uh, breathing. Because, as you know, pollen does have an effect. Anyway, uh, how are you? Poor Donald Trump. He put his lawyer in a bind yesterday. He puts all of his lawyers in a bind, but uh, bad way to start off. Now, as I'm paying more and more attention to this particular trial, um, Donald Trump is essentially using the sovereign citizen defense. He doesn't recognize our courts. He doesn't recognize our laws. And apparently he's got a card that says that he's, what are sovereign citizens? They're citizens of the planet, citizens of Earth. What, what, what is that? But they are exempt from anything anybody wants to tell them to do. Like, you know, why don't you cross at the corner? I'm a sovereign citizen. I do what I want. Okay, well, when that truck uh, bowls you over, are you going to sue? If you don't recognize our laws and our courts, where are you going to adjudicate it? I have an idea what they have in mind, and that is essentially roving bands of warlords, I guess. Boy. Anyway, uh, he's uh, probably going to come up with uh, the constitutional sheriff defense pretty soon. He's going to bestow upon himself the position of constitutional sheriff and uh, that's the supreme leader of the land. And, you know, he, he'll he make the uh, decisions from the abbreviated version of the pocket-sized constitution. The constitutional sheriffs wear right over their hearts. All right. See, if you put the abridged, abbreviated version. <laughs> Wait a second, abridged? <laughs> Uh, the Reader's Digest version of the Constitution, you know, it leaves a lot out. But they have that over their heart, so it makes it okay. All right. He's going to try everything. And uh, whatever sticks will stick. Yeah. Um, I had a bit of a laugh when uh, one of the usual suspects here in our little burg of Rogue River on the town Facebook page posted a uh, Mark Twain quote <laughs> about essentially people who, you know, in spite of all the evidence, continue to believe what they believe, and that makes them essentially idiots. Yeah, of course, that's not the actual Mark Twain quote, but that's what he put up. People who believe the first thing that they're told without doing their research are idiots. Sounds, sounds like old Mark Twain might have been a Q guy. That's what they're trying to make him out to be. Now, it's rich coming from these people who keep telling us, meaning, you know, we unhuman or inhuman. I think we're, we're not humans to them. We're some sort of evil entity that is really needs to be eradicated from the earth. That's how, what they think about us. They can't make any negotiations with us. We're subhuman. They keep telling us subhumans that inflation is at 20% and it doesn't matter what the evidence is. Then this guy puts up this Mark Twain quote to sort of like poke fun at us for accepting the Fed calculator on inflation. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. How do you argue with somebody like that? How do you play baseball with someone like that? We're going to play without umpires and you're going to decide? Thanks. That's why we have umpires, pal. So, present any type of evidence and what happens? That gets restricted. And I'm finding out that these usual suspects are not restricted from posting any of their stuff, but any type of rebuttals outside of comments within that particular stream are not allowed. Has to go through a moderator for review. 
So when you use actual government documents and calculations, they won't let anyone know about that because, well, who's the idiot? I know that it's this guy's little sandbox and he can be a petty tyrant. But this is the same BS from the same group of bad actors here in town who did this BS during Malheur 2015 in the lead up to Trump colluding with the Russians to take over the United States of America. And then they just laugh. Oh, you believe the Russian hoax? Well, it turns out all that fake news we heard about from Donald Trump is because he was perpetrating fake news and he thinks that if he's doing it, everybody else is doing it worse. That, in a nutshell, is the MAGA hat. Hive mind. MAGA. Hive mind. If I'm doing something, somebody else is doing it worse. The whole world is corrupt. Everybody is transactional. Everybody is self-interested. No one does anything out of charity. If you are collecting money for a charity, you're obligated to steal from it. Everybody else does. This is what we are arguing against. And then I get the little rebuttals of, somewhere history changed. Somewhere our morality changed. Yeah, I'll tell you where it was. You damn birchers coming in here saying, I can't be nice to my neighbor because of the color of their skin. And you can't force me to be nice to my neighbor no matter what the color of their skin is. I won't do it. And especially those people that we've had subjugated for hundreds of years. And you want me to make nice with them now? That is unconstitutional. Yes. See, this is what we're dealing with. They live in some sort of fantasy world. And they're making it a reality for the rest of us. We are the liars of history. I, it's just, well, we were warned. Any number of treatises, books of fiction, dystopian universes described to us of what the future could be. We were warned. And now it's playing out exactly as uh, we were warned about. Pretty soon, the West Coast is going to be you know, Japan. And the West Coast is going to be the imperial Nazi universe of uh, America. And in the middle is the great uh, demilitarized zone where all the fighting occurs. Why does the de fighting always occur in the demilitarized zone? I don't get that, but it does. So it's going to be like Red Dawn. It's going to be like uh, Man in the High Castle. <sighs> We're all going to be uh, collecting artifacts and antiques to fill our homes with, to remind ourselves of when America was great. Okay. Yep. Now, some people would call that crazy, and they would be right. Okay. Uh, well, who do we blame? Is that important that we assess blame? Knowing who the bad actors were might help a little bit. But as usual, they set the fire. They caused the fire to burn even more than just the house they're setting on fire. And once again, they're coming up to us to fix it. And then when they fix it, they'll blame us for all the evils in the world. And they have to burn the world down because we are so evil. I don't know. There's nowhere to run and hide from that. Yep. So, uh, at least we could go to vote, you know, in spite of the obstacles. I love the fact that uh, Laura Bush is basically saying, yeah, we're going to send out a bunch of brown shirt thugs to intimidate people at the polls and we're going to actually physically handle the ballots. 
We have mail-in voting here. Who are you going to intimidate at the drop box? The post office? We have a story about what DeJoy's doing to the ballot at the post office. What is she talking about? Election monitors? Armed election monitors demanding to manipulate the ballots? What the hell are you talking about, lady? I know, I know. It's that old Stalin thing, or even maybe it might have been Trotsky. doesn't matter who's voting, it's who's counting the ballots. That's who's important. Is that the advice that you're going by? And where did you get that advice? You got it from Steve Bannon. Because he's voiced it any number of times as the strategy that he's using, I guess. Because he doesn't want to have to be nice to his neighbors because of the color of their skin. You should only be able to hate your neighbor because of the color of their skin. You cannot be forced to like them. How about there shouldn't be any force involved? Why don't you just be nice without having to be told that you should? I think that's what they're really saying. I was going to be nice to Joe. You know, I mean, we know Joe. He's a good black guy. It's all those really bad black guys out there we're talking about. Joe's okay. Then when Joe's no longer around there, what do they say? Yeah, all the they say the N word. <laughs> I remember when I came to visit uh, my mom and my stepdad when my stepdad was still alive. This is a bit of time ago. They lived uh, in what Staten, which is outside of uh, Salem, towards the mountains, and a you know, really nice, nice area. But. Uh, Tom, being a World War II war hero, heavily meddled from fighting with the 442nd, you know, the gopher broke Japanese uh, battalion that kicked ass, kicked the Nazis out of uh, Italy. Then he went into France, saved the guys in the Battle of the Bulge. But anyway, of course, he's going to join the local veterans hall. And he was senior uh, electrical engineer for Rockwell for 20-some-odd years, retired from it. And uh, so, he, you know, he, he had some chops. So in these this particular VA hall, he would rewired the whole thing, set it up, you know, with a really nice sound system. Uh, the kitchen was, like, unsafe, so we... Got that all fixed up. You know, it just basically rewired this whole building extensively on his own. He pulled all the wire himself. So I'm sitting in this VA hall as a guest. Now, of course, I'm not Japanese. My Japanese stepdad, my Japanese American stepdad, is my stepdad. So these guys had no idea that I was Tom's stepkid. You know, I'm an adult at the time, of course. And somebody said, hey, this place got really nice. And this other guy said, yeah, that dirty Jap did it. Okay. Oh, Tom's nice. We're talking about all the bad Japanese out there, but not Tom. And as soon as Tom's not there, he's the dirty Jap. Is there racism in the military? I wonder. So, they, in one breath, say that they cannot live in a multicultural democracy that is going too far. It's socialism, it's communism. And then out of the other side of their mouth, in another breath, they claim they are not the racists. We are the racists because we don't accept that the white man is the most discriminated creature in the history of the universe. So it's no wonder why a petty little tyrant here in our little village of Rogue River would say, oh, you don't get to put that up on the bulletin board. 
I control the bulletin board. You don't. So they can say that Antifa, busloads of Antifa and Black Lives Matter are coming across the bridge to come into town and turn us all into commie socialists, uh, baby-eating Democrats. And that will then mobilize the several hundred, I don't know, night riders armed to make sure that doesn't happen to the point that the cops, not just in town, but in the surrounding areas, had to come down and quell a potential riot against an enemy that was not appearing. Can you believe that? So who gets restricted in the midst of that with it about, you know, trying to disseminate information? I wonder. And we all know who. So it's, as I will keep repeating, it's 2015, 2016 all over again, and they're trying the same plays from the same playbook. We don't have to put up with it. And apparently we're not. So there. Oh, I better get into telling you what we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe as we start off on this fabulous Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Well, Justice, just here we go. Justice Sotomayor sliced through the spin in the Grants Pass Make Homelessness a Crime case. Yeah, Grants Pass. Told you, I think yesterday that they were, they were a sundown town into about the mid seventies, and we in Cottonmouth refused to play in Grants Pass because of it. Alabama lawmakers passed a bill that blocks state incentives to companies that voluntarily recognize unions. What? Yeah, freedom in America. And just in time for the election, Postmaster General DeJoy is committed to rerouting mail for processing so that letter delivery takes 7 to 10 days when it used to just take about 2 So I put my ballot in the drop box at the public library here in town. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a far-right German EU lawmaker's aide has been arrested on suspicion of spying for China. Don't go to sleep on China. They're right there, too. And Japan's moon lander was not built to survive a weeks-long lunar night. But it is still going after three. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, and it is out of the Los Angeles Times by Anita Chabria. Hello and happy Tuesday, because this was written yesterday, of course you know. There are 195 days left, but there's only 194 because it's the day after this was written, as you know. Until the election, and we're in the Supreme Court, where... Sotomayor showed up like the new RG, RBG. Now, SMS is the, that's Sotomayor, Maria Sotomayor, Sonia Maria Sotomayor, the first Hispanic justice of the court, and a lady you don't want to mess with. 
As the lawyer for Grant's past found out, the justices on Monday heard oral arguments in the city of Grant's Pass, Oregon versus Gloria Johnson case. Here's why that much hype case may turn out to be a big nothing and how Sotomayor led the court's liberal alliance arguing that conclusion. If you read or if you read any news or even secretly got your worldview from TikTok, you're already sick of hearing about Grants Pass and how the outcome of this case will forever determine how we deal with homelessness. But stick with me, as Anita says here, because of much of what you heard is not quite true. Grants Pass passed a law, now this is things you already know, against public sleeping, in particular snoozing with a blanket. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit stayed the law, saying it was cruel and unusual punishment that was basically making it illegal to be homeless. Politicians and local government leaders have since been in a tizzy that Grant's Pass ties our hands when it comes to doing anything about encampments, as if Grant's Pass is the boogeyman of legal decisions that will attack from the shadows if you so much as think about moving a tent. Now, Governor Gavin Newsom has even said Grants Pass and associated lawsuits have plagued our efforts to clear encampments and deliver services to those in need. Now, here's what you may not have heard. That is a ridiculous argument, according to Claire Pastor, a law professor at USC and many other smart people that Anita has talked to. There's nothing in Grants Pass that says governments can't have reasonable laws, Pastor said. The question here is, being a fairly uh, close local, is that Grants Pass is run by MAGAs. And the ones who are not MAGAs are trying to keep him at bay. And it doesn't look like the MAGA Supreme Court is going to help. Well, they're going to help the MAGAs. The case made it to the Supreme Court where Sotomayor did not mince words when she said Grants Pass is not about fires, it's not about tents attacking the perception that the Ninth Circuit injunction stops cities from enforcing laws against dangers such as, say, camping in the middle of a freeway or lighting a bonfire next to a preschool. Virtually every other city has so-called time, place, and manner laws that regulate when, where, and how people can exist unhoused, and they are not at issue in Grants Pass, she pointed out. If anyone doubts that Sotomayor is a leader of the liberal bloc, take a minute to listen to how she engages in arguments, quick, ruthless, and pointed. The Supreme Court seemed to agree with her. Some justices asked why Grants Pass had to make this law instead of something more restrained. By the end, it seemed that Grants Pass was about one city going too far and politicians who need a boogeyman in an election year. Associated Press staff bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Alabama lawmakers voted yesterday Tuesday to withhold economic incentive dollars from companies that voluntarily recognize a union instead of holding a secret ballot election. The Alabama House of Representatives voted 72 to 30 for the Senate passed bill after adding minor amendments. The bill now returns to the Alabama Senate, where senators will decide whether to go along with House changes to the bill. The legislation, which would impact future incentive packages, comes as multiple Southern governors oppose a unionization push directed at auto manufacturers that has been lured to the South with the, health, with the help of large incentive packages. Georgia Governor Brian Kemp signed similar legislation on Monday, and Tennessee has a similar law in place. 
The measure says that companies would be ineligible for economic development incentives if they voluntarily recognize a union after a majority of employees return union authorization cards, a process sometimes called card checkoff. A secret ballot election over creating a union would be required for the company to remain eligible for economic incentives. Opponents argue that the proposal could be in conflict with the National Labor Relations Act, which governs union organizing and allows companies to voluntarily recognize unions that show support from a majority of the employees. Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The USPS announced yesterday, Tuesday, it will follow through with its plan to reroute Reno area mail processing to Sacramento, a move that drew bipartisan ire from Nevada lawmakers while raising questions about the rate at which mail ballots can be processed in a par- populous part of a crucial swing state. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy has cast the permanent measure as a cost-saving move, but federal, state, and local lawmakers have complained about a lack of transparency in the process that could slow mail throughout the region. Could? It already has. Under the plan, all mail from the Reno area will pass through Sacramento before reaching its destination, even from one side of the city to another. Well, we are are already experiencing that here in Southern Oregon. In uh, what used to take uh, about a day to two days to have a letter delivered here in town, now takes almost 10 because it gets sent to Medford, then trucked up to Portland, then trucked all the way back, and then dropped off at where they're supposed to be dropped off at. And... Since we're a mail-in ballot state, it looks like we're going to be using a lot more drop boxes. Okay, let us now get to a very short break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. NetRootsRadio.com Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1937. That was the day a truce came in the Stockton cannery workers' strike. It was a pivotal moment that embodied the conflicts of the 1930s labor movement. The AFL initially wrote agricultural workers off as unorganizable. They soon raced to unionize California canneries ahead of the International Longshoremen's Association's March Inland to organize warehouse workers. By early 
April, Agricultural Workers Union 20221, representing five canneries, demanded higher pay, better working conditions, and a closed shop. The canners and growers refused on the basis that they had just granted a 25% raise to the workers. They then attempted to spike union support among workers, whether AFL or CIO, by arguing, quote, one was dominated by communists, the other by racketeers. So take your choice. Soon, they formed a Citizens Labor Investigating Committee to thwart the impending strike. Picket lines went up in the early hours of April 15th. Growers and canners appealed to law enforcement to do something and appealed to the public to enlist in the forcible reopening of the canneries. Dubbed the Pick Handle Army, anti-union forces joined the sheriff's department in confronting the strikers on the 23rd. There, they battled with picketers for over three hours in what is referred to as the Spinach Riot. Picketers confronted scabs and spinach delivery drivers and were beaten, gassed, and shot by sheriff's forces, resulting in one death and 58 injuries of strikers. Considered one of the worst labor battles in California's history, the state federation moved to strip the union of its charter once the truce was called. They reorganized workers as Cannery Workers Union 20676 and won sole recognition. But agricultural workers would remain unorganized for years to come. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs in the low to mid 70s, sunny conditions at currently with a mix of clouds and sun later on this morning will give way to mostly cloudy skies this, this afternoon with winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Partly cloudy skies overnight with lows in the mid 40s, winds out of the west northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then light rain tomorrow early, remaining cloudy with showers in the afternoon. Looks like we're going to get about a quarter inch of rain from this first dropping. Winds will be picking up out of the west southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Looking forward to that. Looks like we have rain both tomorrow and Friday with copious amounts of water falling from the sky. Grass pollen is that pollen that was causing me to be very stuffed up earlier. And it is rated high. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 25 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is high at level 6. So do take care. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.1 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 82%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the Weather Underground. London is 50 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 49 degrees and partly cloudy. Rome is 58 degrees and partly cloudy. Kabul is 60 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 66 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 58 degrees and cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 52 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 39 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is... Weather from around the world, 
brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A man who works for a prominent German far right lawmaker in the European Parliament has been arrested on suspicion of spying for China. The detention came less than 24 hours after three people were arrested for spying for China in a separate German case. The suspect was arrested Monday in the eastern German city of Dresden. They said that he has worked for a German lawmaker in the EU's legislature since 2019. The German national is accused of working for a Chinese intelligence service and of repeatedly passing on information on negotiations and decisions in the European Parliament in January. Prosecutors allege that he also snooped on Chinese dissidents in Germany. Prosecutors did not identify the lawmaker, but Maximilian Craw of the far-right Alternative for Germany, who is his party's top candidate in the European Parliament election in early June, said in a statement that he found out about the arrest of employee Jean Gao from the press yesterday, Tuesday. I do not have further information, Cross said. He added that the spying activity for a foreign state is a serious allegation, which, if proven, would lead to the employee's immediate dismissal. Do you think? German Interior Minister Nancy Faeser said the spying allegations were extremely serious. It was, is confirmed that he was spying for Chinese intelligence from inside the European Parliament. Then that is an attack from inside on European democracy, Fraser said in a statement. Anyone who employ, employs such a staff member also carries responsibility, she added. This case must be cleared up precisely. All the connections and background must be illuminated. Chipper that just started up outside the mothership here. During that musical interlude, thanks a lot, guys. Mari Yamaguchi at the Associated Press's World Desk brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Japan's first moon lander has survived a third freezing lunar night. The Japanese Space Agency said today after receiving an image from the device three months after it landed on the moon. The Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency said the lunar probe responded to a signal from the Earth last night, Tuesday, confirming it has survived another weeks-long lunar night. Temperatures can fall to minus 274 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, then rise to around 212 Fahrenheit during a lunar day. 
the probe, Smart Lander for Investing Moon, or SLIM, reached the lunar surface on January 20th, making Japan the fifth country to successfully place a probe on the moon. SLIM on January 20th landed the wrong way up, meaning it was upside down, with its solar panels initially unable to see the sun and had to be turned off within hours, but powered on when the sun rose eight days later. SLIM, which was tasked with testing Japan's pinpoint landing technology and collecting geological data and images, was not designed to survive lunar nights. The Japanese space agency said on social media platform Twitter, it's not X, Twitter, that SLIM's key functions are still working despite repeated harsh cycles of temperature changes. The agency said it plans to closely monitor the lander's deterioration. Well, that's nice. And it also brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know that Roots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, so do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver